Yep, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got myself into this mess. Well, let's just start at the beginning. It was back in 1978 when John Carpenter's Halloween first hit theaters and introduced the world to a new icon of horror. Within just a few years, it had an unexpected but undeniable impact, inspiring countless emulators and continuing to influence the genre over 40 years later. The film also spawned its own franchise of sequels and requels that, like its silent antagonist, refuses to stay dead. In fact, on October 14th, the Halloween series will become perhaps the longest running horror series of all time with a total of 13 entries. And after the release of Halloween 2018, it officially became the highest grossing, finally outselling both Freddy and Jason. Despite this, it's hard for even the most die-hard Halloweeners to deny that the series viewed collectively is a fucking mess, with more than its fair share of bad movies and at least one or two terrible ones. So what happened? How did Halloween go from imitated to imitator? How did such an iconic horror series fall so far, only to get back to its feet and plummet again almost immediately, multiple times? The origins of this blockbuster Hollywood franchise began in the grimy drive-ins and grindhouses of the mid-70s where a new generation of horror directors were pushing the limits of the genre, and good taste in general. Most of these were exploitation films in the purest definition, created not out of any artistic drive, but solely to turn a modest profit by marketing sex and violence, and sexual violence and violent sex, you get the idea. But some of them managed to achieve something beyond their tawdry trappings, with a few even becoming indisputable classic and making tons of money from tiny budgets. It was in this exciting new frontier that independent producer Erwin Yablons and his financier Mustafa Akkad were looking to stake their claim and hopefully strike gold. They sought out a young John Carpenter after seeing Assault on Precinct 13 and asked him to write and direct a movie about a serial killer stalking and murdering babysitters. Carpenter accepted and wrote a script with his then-girlfriend Deborah Hill that was literally just called The Babysitter Murders. And in some alternate universe, horror fans everywhere are eagerly awaiting the release of The Babysitter Murders End. But in our universe, Yablon suggested that the film take place on Halloween night and be titled simply Halloween once he realized that no one had yet been shameless enough to just name a movie after World Spooky Day and fully capitalize on the holiday. Carpenter and Hill's revised version begins on Halloween night 1963 in Haddonfield, Illinois, when a six-year-old Michael Myers stabs his sister to death while still in his trick-or-treating costume. He's sent to Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where Dr. Sam Loomis would serve as his psychiatrist and caretaker until, one rainy Halloween night 15 years after his first murder, Michael escapes and makes his way back to Haddonfield to kill again. There we meet Lori Strode, a studious high school girl who's disappointed that her spooky day will be spent babysitting while everyone else is out baby making. Her family owns the real estate company that's been struggling to sell the old Myers house, which has become a local urban legend. And that's where she first catches the attention of Michael, who spends the rest of the film obsessively stalking her and her other babysitter friends. Guess what happens to them? All the while with Dr. Sam Loomis in hot pursuit. After killing off her friends one by one, Michael hunts Laurie in a scene that should be a masterclass in suspense. Laurie's able to hold her own against Michael for a while, even though she repeatedly employs the questionable self-disarm tactic. That's right, David, it's an unorthodox strategy, but she seems to be making it work for her. Oh, beautiful offense! But the shape won't stay down, even when Loomis turns up and empties a whole six-shooter into him, leaving us on one of the best cliffhangers in film history. To Carpenter and Hill, this ending was the perfect, or is it, conclusion to a simple yet stylish slasher. To the more cynically-minded Yablons and Akkad, however, the ending was practically begging for a sequel. They would also be begging for a sequel once the film was released and ended up surpassing Texas Chainsaw Massacre as the highest grossing independent film of all time. By the end of its theatrical run, it had made over 70 million worldwide on a $300,000 budget, almost exclusively through word of mouth. No one was more surprised by this success than Carpenter himself, who had spent a mere 10 days writing the script with Hill, 21 days shooting it, and only 3 days doing the music. He'd meant to make a decent cheapo slasher movie and accidentally made a horror classic. Halloween is the most iconic horror movie ever made, and so, so, uh, 
so to be connected it. While it still has traces of its exploitation flick roots, oh no, I've spilled popcorn everywhere. Better take off all my clothes. Oh no, stepbrother, I got stuck in the window again. Carpenter's reserved and atmospheric style, along with his minimalist score and Dean Cundey's gorgeous photography, elevated the movie above its sensationalist peers. In fact, the most shocking thing about it now is how restrained and almost quaint it is. The deaths are basically bloodless, and the emphasis is clearly more on the suspense before for the kills rather than the kills themselves. Halloween's impact on horror was immediately obvious. It directly inspired Sean Cunningham to make Friday the 13th just a couple years later, which became massively popular and pushed the focus of the genre toward increasingly bloody and over-the-top deaths. Seeing the slasher boom in full effect, Yablons and Akkad were eagerly awaiting a sequel to Halloween, which Carpenter had previously agreed to. But already foreseeing the horrors to come, he attempted to skip out on the project entirely. In Carpenter's original agreement, he was set to write and direct Halloween 2 in exchange for getting funding and distribution for The Fog. But dreading the task of squeezing more story out of the Myers character, he attempted to start production of The Fog at a rival studio. Yablons, now backed by Universal for distribution, took Carpenter to court and forced him to honor his writing obligation. I mean, legal duress probably isn't the best condition to start your franchise under, but hey, what could go wrong? Carpenter would begrudgingly and bedrunkenly write that script. Six pack of beer a night, sitting in front of the typewriter saying, what in the hell can I put down? One which he would more or less disown publicly soon after the film's release. It picks up literal moments after that famous cliffhanger and follows Lori as she's taken to the most poorly lit and poorly staffed hospital in Illinois. Loomis and Sheriff Brackett continue their search for Michael, but the shape is already making his way to the hospital to hunt Lori down again. He slowly, very slowly, picks off the security guard, the ambulance driver, and all the nurses to clear the way to Lori, who we discover in a last minute plot twist is actually Michael's younger sister, adopted by the Strodes after the death of the Myers parents. This single plot point, which kind of seems like an afterthought in the actual film, would dictate the course of the franchise for almost 40 years, much to Carpenter's dismay. He seemed to realize at the time that this somewhat spoiled Michael's mystique, but was desperate to add some kind of story element to avoid the sequel being an exact repeat of the first film. We're remaking the same film, only not as good. But the twist doesn't even really affect anything after that point except to clue in Loomis about where Michael is. Once he gets to the hospital, it never comes up again. It's not used to help stop or stall Michael, and Laurie's never even told about it at all. Michael just continues to chase Loomis and Laurie around the hospital until they reach an operating room. Laurie's able to blind Michael, and Loomis begins slowly releasing canisters of flammable gas into the room. After telling Laurie to run, I guess, he sacrifices himself to take out Michael, igniting the gas and causing a massive explosion. But Michael's entitled to one more good scare before collapsing and burning to death. Carpenter and Hill intentionally wanted to kill off Michael and Loomis in the most overt way possible in an effort to rule out any more sequels. But if there's one thing we've learned from a dozen Halloween films, it's that no death is too final for a little Hollywood magic. After production wrapped, Carpenter saw director Rick Rosenthal's early cut and found it dull, deciding to return as a ghost director for several new scenes that added more gruesome kills. Rosenthal would complain about Carpenter's interference, but while these additions can be somewhat gratuitous, the film definitely wouldn't be any better without them. Even though it has some great moments, the released version of Halloween 2 already drags a lot, so we can only imagine what an even slower paced version would be like. There's an inordinate amount of time spent with the hospital staff to the point where you almost forget Laurie's even here. Instead, we're treated to Bud and Jimmy and Nurse Jill and fucking Mr. Garrett and all these boring ass side characters. But why don't you just shut up, all right? Halloween 2 works pretty well when viewed as a double feature with the original, but on its own, it's just not very impressive or interesting. It was financially successful, but not exactly adored when it was released, with critics and audiences recognizing the obvious. There was really nowhere else to go with the Michael Myers saga. Only a few years after the original, and everyone unanimously seemed to agree that this should be Michael's definitive death. You don't know what death is. Even Yablons and Akkad seemed to recognize that Carpenter was right. In exchange for Carpenter and Hill signing on as producers for part three, they agreed to abandon Michael Myers for good and make Halloween into an anthology series, with each movie being completely unrelated except for the Halloween setting. Under different circumstances, this new direction might have breathed life back into the series and opened it up to a world of possibilities. But then, Halloween 3 happened. 
Quatermass writer Nigel Neal was initially contracted to pin the script, but he'd request to go uncredited once more gore and violence were added by the studio. The story remained mostly intact, but the writing credit would go to director Tommy Lee Wallace, production designer for the original Halloween and creator of the first Myers Mask, who was decidedly against all things stabby. Halloween 3 is not a knife movie. Halloween 3 The Season of the Witch centers on Dr. Daniel Chalice, who receives an emergency patient in the week leading up to Halloween. This patient whispers a cryptic message to him, and later that night is murdered by a suited man who promptly immolates himself with a car bomb. The murdered man's daughter, Ellie, seeks out Dr. Chalice and asks for his help in uncovering the truth of her father's death. He was last seen driving out to the Silver Shamrock Mask Factory, and Ellie thinks there might be a connection. And it turns out that Doc is just the man to help, because Dr. Chalice fucks. Like, he's literally hooking up with every woman in this movie. Even Ellie, whose father was just murdered under mysterious circumstances, is already down to fuck as soon as they get to this crummy motel. And look, she even brought lingerie to investigate his death. You know, just in case. Where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? They discover the town where the factory is located is completely under the control of Silver Shamrock founder Connell Cochran and his small army of sharply dressed weirdos. Long story short, it turns out these weirdos are actually robots that Cochran has created to help him steal a piece of fucking Stonehenge, <laughs> fragments of which are put into microchips within every mask. His ultimate goal is to revive the ancient pagan rituals of Samhain by triggering the microchips through a TV signal, instantly sacrificing the countless children wearing them. Chalice manages to sabotage his efforts, causing the factory to explode. But in a double twist ending, it turns out Ellie was killed and replaced by a robot weirdo, and Dr. Chalice ultimately fails to stop the commercial from airing, leading to an ending right out of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Though it wasn't a bomb, it made significantly less money than the previous two. It wasn't well received by critics and was pretty much rejected entirely by the Halloween fandom, some of whom felt gypped that Myers was nowhere to be seen except for a small meta reference. Don't you have any Halloween spirit? No. This icy reception seemed to confirm for the studio and producers that all people wanted out of these movies was Michael Myers killing people. And from that point on, that's all they would ever give us. Halloween 3's reputation would slowly improve over the years, with some fans now holding it up as one of the great underrated horror films. And certainly it seems refreshing among the milieu of Myers retreads, but the film has plenty of its own issues. Except for a couple of outliers, the horror scenes in this horror movie are clumsy and have little to no impact. Where is Not to mention the bizarre and unfunny comedy relief characters introduced at the motel, where the movie totally grinds to a halt and pisses any of its tension into the wind. Maybe a movie that fit tonally with the first two would have been more well received, even if Michael wasn't in it. But instead we got this weird sci-fi, fantasy, techno-magical, thriller, mystery movie that tries its hand at a lot of different things and doesn't excel at any of them. This film's failures basically ruined the entire franchise's chance of ever pulling itself out of its own feedback loop and doomed it to endless repetition. It's your own fault and I don't feel a bit sorry for you. After the disappointment that was Season of the Witch, it was clear that a Halloween movie not revolving around Michael Myers was never going to get greenlit again. An exhausted Carpenter and Hill finally sold their stakes in the franchise entirely, and Yablons would drop out soon after, leaving the series in the hands of Akkad alone. But it would take over six years for him to actually start production on the fourth film, eventually hiring director Dwight Little based on the strength of some long-forgotten 80s bargain bin feature. Shooting began in April of 1988, and by October, Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers was released, finally giving all the fans what they... wanted? The film begins 10 years after Halloween 2, where Michael somehow did not die in that explosion, and has merely been in a comatose state for a decade. He's transferred back to Smith's Grove, but somehow overhearing through his coma that he now has a niece, Michael jolts back to consciousness and fucking hulks out on the ambulance personnel. Seriously, when we see the crime scene later, it's hilariously over the top. And that's just not like Michael to leave a mess like that. He's actually quite the ambitious little artist deep down, always setting up little pranks with the dead bodies or using them in some kind of modern art tableau. We're then introduced to the niece in question. Jamie Lloyd is the daughter of Laurie Strode, who has died in an off-screen car crash, and a real-life Jamie Lee Curtis said no. Are you insane? 
Lari's orphan daughter now lives with her foster family and is starting to have nightmares about her murderous uncle, even though she's not supposed to know what he looks like. Dr. Loomis, who also equipped plus 20 explosion defense magic, soon hears of Michael's escape and heads to Haddonfield, where he implores the new sheriff to help him stop the monster before he kills again. To clear the way to Jamie, Michael blows up a transformer at the power station, shutting off all the electricity in town, before going to the police department and killing literally everybody, presumably in some kind of X-Men ass action scene. The local drunks all get their guns and form a lynch mob to hunt down Michael, and almost immediately kill an innocent person. Shit. Eventually Michael finds his prey and chases them through a house, through a school, on top of a car, etc, etc, until he's finally cornered by the remaining cops and their deputized drunks who absolutely unload on him. He falls down a big fucking hole all the way to hell, and everything is right with the world again. Michael Myers is in hell. Until Jamie, in some sort of psychotic trance, stabs her foster mother to death and seemingly becomes the new embodiment of evil. The much-hyped return of the title didn't exactly light the world on fire when it was released, and barely made more than Halloween 3, though it did manage to spawn the underground dance hit Jamie's an Orphan. Yeah. Critics were pretty much unanimously negative, complaining that the film was somehow dull, ridiculous, and not scary all at the same time. Little would later say that he'd wanted to portray Michael as a physical, flesh and blood serial killer, not an enigmatic force of nature. Ironic, because while this movie's Michael isn't really supernatural, he is definitely super powered. Halloween 4 also begins many of the common contrivances that would plague the series time and again, like Michael having to recreate his exact same outfit every time he escapes because that's the look that sells. Though he did also spring for a pimped out alternate colorway this time. I still believe that the reason that mask in the throwing uh, Loomis through the door in the elementary school is off is because someone ran to the prop truck at four in the morning and brought in the wrong mask and everybody was too overtired to catch it. I really think that was a, a mistake. And uh, had we more time or money, we probably should have gone back and reshot it. No, no, I'm sorry. There's no reasonable excuse for even shooting the scene if that's what the mask looked like. Don't you have eyes, Dwight? Didn't anyone on set have eyes? Besides being a proto-soft reboot before the term existed, there's not a lot to say about Halloween 4. The fandom eventually embraced it, however, probably because most of the movies that came after it were far worse. But their response at the time must have been enthusiastic enough because Akkad immediately started production on Halloween 5 without so much as a finished script. Though the ending of part 4 promised a new spin and possibly a new shape for the series, Akkad ended up rejecting the scripts that featured an evil Jamie in favor of one where Michael is resurrected to do the same shit all over again, but this time with a more overtly supernatural twist, featuring telepathic visions and some kind of vague occulty things going on. The director wanted to make these occulty things much less vague, but they were eventually toned down by someone who was thinking with their actual brain. The version that hit theaters begins with Michael Myers escaping the pit before falling into a coma where he's found and nursed back to health by a random old hermit. In that first cut, this character was actually a voodoo magician named Dr. Death who resurrects Michael as if an occult hand had. Either way, he reawakens a year later and goes on the hunt for Jamie again, who's now in a children's hospital without the ability to speak due to her trauma. Her nightmares of Michael are getting worse, and Loomis, who's fucking nuts in this movie, by the way, is convinced that he's still alive. Michael gets to Haddonfield and hunts down Jamie, killing her foster sister and slashing his way through a long list of completely unlikable, unmemorable characters who take up way more time than the leads from the last movie, including a pair of bumbling cops who are always accompanied by cartoon comedy sound effects. Michael catches Jamie and takes her to see his newest art installation where both attempt to connect with each other. But Uncle Boogeyman freaks out and resumes the chase. Luckily Loomis arrives in time to grab her and use her as bait, Jesus. Let's play a game. <laughs> But that was only to lure Michael into a trap where he drops a steel net on top of him and beats him with a plank of wood. 
Yep, that was the plan. Six bullets, not enough. Giant explosion, not enough. A million bullets, still not enough. But a big old piece of wood, now, now that just might do the trick. Loomis does keep Michael down long enough for the cops to arrest him, but also ends up giving himself a stroke or a heart attack or something. The cops assure Jamie that she's safe now with Michael in prison, but she knows better. Throughout the movie, we've caught glimpses of some kind of mysterious gunslinger type character called The Man in Black, who was inserted into the film with absolutely no plans for his identity or purpose. At the end, we see he's blown Michael out of jail like an old timey prison break, and that's our cliffhanger. Or actually more like a dead end since nobody working on the film had any ideas on where to go from here. This doesn't make any sense. They shot other scenes. It's like, well, why are we filming these? And he goes, well, this will go into the part six. Upon release, Halloween 5 made less than its predecessor, and less than every other Halloween movie for that matter. Reviews and fan reactions were equally dismal, leaving a cod in the franchise at large fumbling for direction. Not only would the next film have to reinvigorate waning interest in Michael Myers, it would also have to make something coherent out of all this man in black and occult tattoo nonsense. Despite the cliffhanger, Akkad put the series on hold, entertaining various outlandish pitches, and six years would pass before the next Halloween entered production. Of course, by the time the film was finished, it wouldn't actually be called Halloween 6, or Halloween Triple Six, thankfully. And it wasn't just in Akkad's control anymore, either. A complex series of lawsuits had tied up the rights to the franchise for years until they ended up being owned by Dimension Films, which was owned by Miramax, which was owned by an actual real-life horror villain. Akkad's company was now only one of four credited production companies, and this new power dynamic would drastically affect the final film. Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers begins by slightly retconning the end of part five. Apparently Jamie was abducted by the man in black shortly after he helped Michael escape, and he's kept them in some kind of dungeon lair for the last six years. We learn that he's the leader of some kind of neo-pagan cult that has impregnated a now 15-year-old Jamie. After she gives birth, a reluctant member of the cult secretly gives Jamie back her mystery baby and helps her escape. But Michael, apparently having always been under the control of the cult, is not far behind. He finds Jamie and kills her within the first 20 minutes, but not before she manages to stash the baby away. Back in Haddonfield, Halloween has been banned, and we're introduced to starring and introducing Paul Stephen Rudd as Tommy Doyle, the kid Laurie babysat in the original Halloween. But this time I'll be ready. He's now a reclusive conspiracy nut, obsessed with the occult and the legends of Michael Myers. So obsessed that he now lives in a boarding house right next to the Myers house where Laurie's cousin Kara Strode is living with her family. Tommy happens to be listening to a sleazy talk radio show, along with everyone else in town apparently, right when a frantic Jamie calls in as she's trying to escape Michael. He hears the sounds of the train station in the background and goes to investigate, finding the mystery baby in the bathroom. He then seeks out Loomis, who's been retired until recently being asked to return to Smith's Grove by his old colleague Dr. Wynn. Remember him from the first movie? No? Uh, okay, anyway, Tommy's done a bunch of research on the Thorn Rune and believes that Michael is under a curse that compels him to kill off members of his bloodline whenever Mercury is in retrograde on Halloween or some fucking shit. He knows that Michael is after the mystery baby to complete the sacrifice of his family, so he and Loomis rush to protect Kara and her son Danny. We learn that Danny is showing signs of being a potential psycho and might also be thorn powered before the cult abducts him along with Kara and Jamie's baby. Loomis and Tommy follow them to Smith's Grove, where it turns out the entire staff of the hospital were cult members all along, and they're now prepping for some kind of surgery using Danny and the mystery baby. So are they gonna put the baby's brain in Danny, or Danny's brain in the soul of the baby? You know what, Never mind. I think it's cool. Tommy saves Kara, and they watch as Michael, for some reason, suddenly turns on the cult and murders all of them. Our leads save the kids, and Tommy's able to inject Michael with some glow stick fluid and beat him with a pipe. Problem solved. Loomis stays behind and says he has some unfinished business and goes back inside where we see Michael's mask laying on the floor and hear Loomis screaming in the background. Then just credits. You might not be surprised to learn that this non-ending was not the original conclusion, but rather the result of a lengthy dispute between the Weinsteins, Akkad, and Nightfall Productions. The original ending was definitely less vague, but probably more idiotic. In this version, Michael is thwarted by Tommy's knowledge of runic magic when he arranges some stones in a circle and stops the shape dead in his tracks. 
When Loomis returns, Michael has pulled a super secret switcheroo, as it turns out to be Dr. Wynn under the mask. Wynn then passes the thorn curse over to Loomis, who screams in non-specific anguish. <laughs> Test audiences hated the cult elements, and the Weinsteins mandated a slew of reshoots that toned them down, including turning the ritual sacrifice into that unexplained surgery, nixing the hilarious Dracula outfits, and filling it with bizarre editing. <laughs> Not sure if those mandates included more candles, because holy shit, there's so many candles in this movie. Candles all over the room, candles when you're having sex, candles when you're taking a shower? I mean, come on, what is this? House of Wax? It is wax. Literally. The recut version released to theaters in 1995, and while it performed slightly better than the previous two Halloween films, most fans and critics seem to agree that it was maybe the worst so far. The film did its best to tie together all the frayed ends of the franchise, but predictably the end result is a convoluted and confused mess. The original version, known as the producer's cut, would circulate at conventions and online for years, and some fans even claim it fixes many of the film's biggest flaws. But actually it probably makes them way worse, cause this version includes the strong implication that the mystery baby was actually an incest baby, being fathered by Michael. Can't imagine why they changed that. The follow-up to Curse of Michael Myers was originally to be a direct sequel, starting right after Tommy and Kara escape and revealing that the entire town of Haddonfield was in on the cult conspiracy. But that all went out the window when, shockingly, Jamie Lee Curtis was enticed to return, hoping to finally make a sequel worthy of the first film's legacy. She initially got some interest from Carpenter and Hill, but slowly their participation dwindled and Curtis was left alone to try bringing the series back to form. John didn't want to direct it. God bless all of you here, but no thanks. Halloween H2O, easily the worst name in the series until Halloween Kills gave it a run for its money, finds Laurie Strode having faked her death and now living as Carrie Tate, headmistress of a prestigious private boarding school. This marks the first official reboot of the timeline, canceling out parts 4, 5, and 6, and picking up from the end of Halloween 2, though they never actually bother to explain how Michael and Loomis survived the explosion this time, or where Michael's been for 20 years. Laurie's still haunted by her experiences, and every Halloween she gets on edge again, seeing hallucinations of Michael everywhere. Her son attends the school she's in charge of, and wait, who was the father again? Well, Dad an abusive, chain-smoking, methadone addict. Okay. So, Michael returns on Halloween night to stalk the school, killing her son's friends until he finds Laurie, whereupon they brawl it out for the heavyweight title once again. Laurie finally manages to get the upper hand when the police arrive and begin to carry Michael off to the hospital. Laurie's seen all these shitty sequels too, apparently, because she immediately jacks the ambulance and waits for Michael to inevitably arise again, then throws him from the van, pins him against a tree, and fucking decapitates him. Jimmy been suspended five times this year already for getting a little crazy with the stick, all right? H2O was a huge hit on release, and is the third highest grossing in the series when adjusted for inflation. Critics were mixed, but the fans were relieved to finally have a decent Halloween movie again, along with Laurie's triumphant return. Watching it now, it holds up as one of the better sequels overall, though it never lives up to its potential. Well, that's... sucky. Plus, they managed to make Michael look shitty in, like, five different ways. But it does have a sick-ass soundtrack, brother. It matches the movie perfectly, because I know whenever I hear Creed, I always get a little chill down the back of my neck. Given that the next installment had no idea what to do with a dead Michael Myers, the most interesting thing about H2O in hindsight is comparing it to the Blumhouse films, which echo this plot in several ways. It's funny to see Laurie preparing for her final epic confrontation with Michael all the way back in 98, and then realizing that she's still preparing for that confrontation over 25 years later. It's almost like no time has passed at all. Despite the success of H2O, Jamie Lee Curtis found the final film disappointing compared to her high hopes. She was on the verge of refusing to return at all unless Michael would remain dead. But legally, this was impossible. A clause in Akkad's contract dictated that Miramax was not allowed to kill off Michael, so any sequel to H2O would need to feature him. I don't want him to be killed, okay? He can be shot, he can be wounded, but not have him in a dynamite blow up or chop his head or do because it means 
you know, he's, he's dead. How can we get him back? But Curtis agreed to return as long as her character would be killed off early in the film and remain safe from any more sequels. And the producers really milked that small appearance as much as they could, featuring her on the poster in almost the exact same prominent position as that for H2O. A few directors were approached to helm this eighth Halloween film, but the job ended up going to Halloween 2 director Rick Rosenthal, who would finally get the chance to present his pure vision away from the meddling hands of Carpenter. Halloween Resurrection is just as terrible and unoriginal as that subtitle would indicate. It begins with Lori now committed in a criminal asylum, and we are told that she did not actually kill Michael at the end of H2O, but rather an ambulance worker that Michael somehow managed to switch clothes with. He finally turns back up to finish Lori off, but she's prepared. She's somehow been allowed to build a wily e. coyote trap on the roof of the sanitarium where she almost manages to catch Michael, but the turn tables and Lori is stabbed and thrown from the roof. I'll see you in hell. Woof. Now with Laurie out of the way, the film can abandon any real obligation to the established continuity, and boy did they ever. The rest of the movie focuses on a new character named Sarah as she and her friends audition for a new internet reality show called Dangertainment, whose directors are played by Tyra Banks and Busta Rhymes. Get his ass, get his ass, get his ass. Sarah and her friends are chosen to be on the show, where they will have to spend Halloween night in the Myers house, which has been equipped with tons of cameras. Before the live stream even begins, Michael arrives and begins picking off the crew. Busta decides to go ahead with the show, even though the cameraman is missing, and the contestants start snooping around the house, looking for clues as to why Michael became a murderer? Look, don't think about it too much. Michael starts killing the cast one by one, but the internet audience believes it's all faked, and the directors literally don't even notice. Eventually they do realize the real Michael is back, and Sarah tries to escape through the network of cobblestone tunnels under the Meyer house. Wait, what? Busta shows up to help and Kung Fu fights Michael before electrocuting him on the penis, which sets the entire house ablaze. Michael is presumed dead and taken to the coroner where he suddenly awakens. Oh no, so scary. <laughs> Resurrection was released in the summer of 2002 to box office success and critical panning. Even the fans mostly hated this installment and its retconning of H2O, often citing it as the worst in the entire franchise. The little praise it did get was mostly for trying to add new elements to the series, but these were all highly derivative of other cultural trends at the time, like reality TV, the new frontier that was the internet, and the Blair Witch Project. It's what's on the pulse, you know, of the world right now, the internet. and. Many also cited the tone-breaking performance of Mr. Rhymes and his fight with Michael, which instantly drained anything intimidating about the shape. You're gonna ruin the whole effect! I done it! His character was originally meant to die after being stabbed, but audiences at test screenings seemed to actually love the character of Freddy and wanted more. Every existing element about you is what the internet audience really wants. Resulting in a constant running monologue from Bus a Bus. Michael Myers is not a soundbite. Spin-off, tie-in, some kind of celebrity scandal. The franchise had now burned through three different potential directions in the span of ten years, leaving it adrift. Akkad would consult with numerous writers and directors probing for any original concept or idea of where to take the series from here. The continuity was in such a dire state that the next film wouldn't waste time with the reboot, instead remaking the series from scratch. After Mustafa Akkad's tragic death in 2005, his son Malik was tasked with finding a filmmaker who could forge a new path forward. Enter one Robert B. Zombie, musician and horror auteur. Cut off a chicken's head, put my dick in it, fuck it, and go, ah! Reasonably, he looked at the current shit show of a franchise and decided the only way he'd get involved would be to start from the beginning and remake the very first film for a newer, edgier generation. Look at this, Mom. <gasps> Lori! Rob Zombie's Halloween makes the incredibly misguided decision to spend almost its entire first hour with a young Michael Myers, instantly demystifying him in the process. We watch as he's bullied at school and at home by completely disgusting and one-dimensional characters who just incessantly spout disgusting and one-dimensional shit. Maybe I'll choke the chick and purge my snorkel all over them flappy ass tits. Think she'd suck my dick for a quarter and let me suck her tits? His only respite comes from his mother, who's the sole source of affection in his life. On Halloween, he finally snaps on a school bully and beats him to death. Going back home, he continues his massacre, killing his older sister, her boyfriend, and his stepdad, all while wearing the adult-sized white Shatner mask, which looks hilarious on a 10-year-old's body. He's sent to Smith's Grove, where he obsesses over making masks for himself and withdraws from the world. 
Fifteen years later, Dr. Loomis abandons hope and closes Michael's case. Great timing too, cause this is exactly when Michael decides to escape Smith's Grove, killing the staff and the guards and later a truck driver for his clothes. He makes his way back to Haddonfield and retrieves his old knife and mask, prepared to recreate his rampage. It's already 54 minutes in and we're just now getting to meet Laurie Strode, which means we only have an hour to get in almost the entirety of the original Halloween. Okay, lightning round. Michael stalks Laurie and her friends, killing them off one by one, while Loomis rushes to Haddonfield and warns the sheriff that Michael is back. They set off to find Michael, who has actually caught Laurie this time and taken her to the Myers house, where he tries to reveal that they're siblings through pantomime. Loomis arrives and fires into Michael, then gets those strong-ass thumbs right in the eyes. Laurie manages to grab Loomis's gun and, after a tussle, shoots Michael in the head at point-blank range. When the remake was released in 2007, it immediately performed better than literally every other sequel. The reviews were mostly negative, but a significant portion of the fanbase continued to defend it as an intense and unique take on the series. And to be fair, it definitely stands out from the previous films, but not in a good way. I hate you! And I hate you! The problem is, Rob Zombie only knows how to make one movie the same way he only knows how to make one song. The song sounds like this, and the movie is like this. Everyone and everything in a Rob Zombie movie is as unpleasant and off-putting as he can possibly make them. Every side character is either a rapist or a racist or a redneck or all three. You done good, cousin. <laughs> Subtlety is Rob Zombie's mortal enemy. There are certainly a lot of horror fans who prefer this gory, grindhousey approach to the slow suspense of the original Halloween, but remaking that movie in this style misses exactly what made it unique. Rob Zombie was committed to making the fully exploitative version of Halloween, upping the body count and the gratuitous nudity without realizing that the original was so well remembered precisely because it wasn't like the other slashers of the time. Torso. 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 It saturates the screen with terror. Torso. Rated R. Zombie meanwhile watched it and thought, man, if only this movie was more like the Mutilator. Someone should remake this into the embarrassing piece of trash it was always meant to be. Despite its success, Zombie was actually reluctant to return for a sequel, but Malik Akkad was able to convince him by promising full creative freedom. The next installment would truly be a pure, uncut Rob Zombie joint. Oh God, no! No! Now able to fully reshape the franchise in his own image, and I mean that literally, Zombie wastes no time setting the tone as Laurie is taken to the hospital following her confrontation with Michael and we get some totally unnecessary extreme close-ups of her fingernails being removed. Cut to Michael's body being transported from the crime scene and who happens to be driving the van? Why, it's some more creepy rednecks. Who could have seen that coming? She still look good to me. Nice old titties are hanging out. <laughs> After they crash into a cow on the road, Michael escapes and we learn that he's seeing visions of his mother, accompanied by a white horse and a younger version of himself imploring him to reunite with his sister Lori. We're then subjected to an almost 15 minute chase through the hospital only to find out it's a fucking dream fake out. It's actually been a full year and instead of being confined to the hospital, Lori is now living with Annie and Sheriff Brackett, played in these movies by the one and only Brad Dourif. Lori's mind state has taken a turn for the worse and she's finally living out her edgy teen phase. Meet my new best friend. Loomis's character has seemingly done a complete reversal. In this movie, he's a shameless huckster marketing a book he wrote to capitalize on the Myers murders. He has nothing in common with the caring child psychologist of the previous movie and is only concerned with making a Clinton-level paycheck for a speech that only lasts 46 seconds. Well, um... Has anybody got any questions at all? Zombie was quoted as saying he wanted Loomis to be more ridiculous in this, and I mean, mission accomplished, Rob. I'd say this whole movie's pretty ridiculous. Get your ass in there. After reading Loomis's book and realizing she's Michael's sister, Lori goes to a Halloween party where she's chased and eventually captured. Michael takes her to an abandoned shack and their shared hallucination commands them to reunite the family in the afterlife. The cops discover their location and surround the cabin before Loomis shows up and tries his hand at hostage negotiation. Now free from her hallucinations, Lori stabs Michael to death and dons his mask, finally completing her transformation. There was an alternate ending where Laurie's shot and killed by the police, but let's be real. 
This movie's not worth discussing more than we have to. The critical and fan reception upon release was tepid at best, except for maybe the most die-hard Rob Zombie fans. Which makes sense, because Halloween 2 is undeniably a Rob Zombie movie, meaning we get even more gore, even more uncomfortable nudity, even more cringy dialogue, and even more noise. It's also the first and only Halloween movie to fully embrace that weird line from the original about Michael eating a dog and actually show it on screen. Halloween 2, Let Loose the Juice, made significantly less than Zombie's first outing, and he mercifully declined to return for another sequel, even though the Weinsteins announced Halloween 3D only a few days later. But thankfully for all future generations, this was cancelled, and about five years later, the franchise rights were acquired by the prolific, if not always prestigious, Blumhouse Productions, who've based basically been dominating the horror world since the late 2000s. Studio head Jason of House Blum offered the writing directing job to several of the biggest voices in horror, including Mike Flanagan and Adam Wingard, before taking it to the next best thing, Danny McBride and David Gordon Green, of your highness fame. They were asked to pitch a concept to John Carpenter, which he apparently approved of. You like that? I like it. But that concept would change drastically by the time it got to theaters. It was announced that the new film would ditch any and all continuity from the series, including Halloween 2, being a direct sequel to the original and nothing else. They also announced the title for this exciting new sequel to the original classic Halloween. Halloween 28 tween begins 40 years after the original. Michael's been back at Smith's Grove this whole time, being caught by the cops shortly after getting shot by Loomis, which really spoils the cliffhanger. At least with the original sequel, we know Michael still goes on to kill a lot more people that night. In this new continuity though, he disappears mysteriously and then just gets caught like an hour later. For some reason, he's being transferred to a maximum security facility now after four decades, and a pair of true crime podcasters are eager to try for an interview before he's moved. They meet the new Loomis, You're the new Loomis, and are allowed to walk right up and taunt Michael with his murder mask in front of all the other mental patients. Then we catch up with Laurie Strode, whose paranoia and trauma from 40 years ago has led her to become reclusive and estranged from her family. She's become fixated on Michael and has been training and preparing for his return, even turning her entire house into an armored fortress. Her daughter resents her for raising her like a doomsday prepper, while her granddaughter Allison is still trying to maintain a relationship. But as Halloween draws near again, Laurie grows even more man and unstable, convinced Michael is coming back. The night before Halloween, the bus transporting Michael and the other patients crashes and Michael escapes to begin his rampage. Word of this soon gets out and Lori takes this as her cue to hunt down Michael once and for all. So much is made of this obsession of hers that it's kinda infuriating when she does find him and manage to wing him, but then she just kinda gives up when the deputy tells her to go back home. I pray every night that he would escape so I can kill him. Like, come on, he was right there! So she takes her daughter back to her fortified homestead as Michael continues his massacre. New Loomis and Deputy Hawkins go out to look for Allison and luckily find her just in time to save her from Michael. But Hawkins and Allison are betrayed by New Loomis, who secretly orchestrated Michael's escape to be able to study him better. As part of this research, he drives the unconscious Michael and Allison to Laurie's house because finally killing her will make Michael killable or something? Like it's a fucking Harry Potter prophecy? Neither can live while the other survives. Not really sure what the motivation would be for this other than Danny McBride realized that without the sibling twist, he didn't really have a good reason for Michael to end up at Laurie's house. Not sure an evil doctor twist is any less contrived, but... All right, sure. Michael wakes up and kills New Loomis and some more comic relief cops. Chocolatey homemade brownie, I made that myself. Allison escapes and they both make their way toward Lori's house. Now inside, Lori commands her daughter and Allison to seek safety in her hidden safe room. She tries to engage with Michael, but honestly, she really fucks it up. I mean, I get it, you can't have Lori easily getting the best of him lest you repeat resurrection, but to have been obsessively preparing for 40 years? She's just making rookie mistake after rookie mistake, Addison. That's right, David, I don't think the judges are gonna look too kindly on this performance. Then she makes probably the biggest rookie mistake possible when she lures Michael into the safe room her family is in and traps him there, which has apparently been her backup plan this whole time? 
Hopefully we don't need to explain how stupid this is considering there's only one way in or out of this fucking room. Somehow this actually works and Michael doesn't just pry these flimsy little bars off. Then Laurie and her family go around the house and turn on the multiple exposed gas lines to incinerate the house. Again, what the fuck kind of a plan is this? I guess she's lucky New Loomis was evil and would nonsensically drive Michael over here because if not she'd just be living in a horribly dangerous booby trapped house for no reason. But it looks like it did come in handy after all as Laurie and her family escape with Michael trapped inside as the house burns down. Before the movie even came out, McBride had confirmed that at least one sequel was all but guaranteed, so this ending really has little impact. However, the film itself certainly did have a lot of impact, where it broke a number of box office records on release. Halloween took the series to a level of commercial and critical success not seen since 1978. While it's vastly superior to most of the sequels, it frustratingly fails to live up to its potential, mostly due to the script. It's easily the best looking Halloween movie since the original two, but in terms of writing, it might be one of the worst. It took priority over your family. It cost you your family. I'm a doctor. Lock your doors. Allison, you're the coolest, you're the prettiest, and you're the nicest girl in school. Could it be that one monster has created another? Could those be the themes of the film? Regardless, McBride and Green managed to renew interest in the Halloween series to a massive degree. There was a lot of genuine hope that this team could successfully steer the franchise out of the mud. Well, that was a dumb thing to pray for. Like Halloween 2 before it, Halloween Kills yes, seriously, takes place on the same night as its predecessor. As Laurie and her family escape the burning house, they pass firefighters on their way to extinguish the flames and inadvertently free Myers once again. And this scene actually has some cool atmosphere at first, but immediately turns into one of the less well-remembered Jason sequels once Michael starts mowing through this crowd of firefighters. Back in town, Tommy Doyle is throwing a 40th anniversary celebration slash memorial and has assembled literally every character from the original film that they could dig up, including Lindsay Wallace, Nurse Chambers, and even fucking Lonnie. Lonnie, get your ass away from there. When they hear of Michael's escape, the party turns into a mob to go track him down. Lori, meanwhile, has been taken to the hospital to recuperate, and actually spends the entire movie here, where she and Hawkins sit around doing basically nothing except clumsily expositing. It was the doctor that took him to your house tonight. It wasn't Michael. He's a six-year-old boy with the strength of a man and the mind of an animal. The film's other themes are just as ham-fistedly demonstrated when one of the other escaped mental patients gets mistaken for Myers and incites the bloodlust of the enraged mob. Ah! This plotline actually takes up a significant portion of the film, reducing Michael and Laurie to side dish status. Eventually, the mob catches up to Michael, and it looks like they finally have him cornered. But then somehow he gets back up and just starts 1v1-ing everybody in the crowd? Did they shoot and edit it like this because it would look hilariously stupid if we could see everyone just standing aside and waiting their turn to get murked? So Michael gets the dub, and in what must be a reference to the work of Roberto Zambé, we end on a freeze frame. Classic. Halloween Kills made quite a lot of money when it was released, but the reception was much less glowing than for the 2018 film, and it's not hard to see why. Halloween 2018 might not have been a great movie, but it was a pretty good one, with technical skill and atmosphere that helped elevate a less than stellar script. I got peanut butter on my penis. But the script for Kills is much worse, and it doesn't have the skill to compensate, filled with bizarre digital zooms and kills that are alternatingly unimpactful and unbelievable. It may not be the worst in the series, but when comparing it to the previous movie's highlights, it's clear that this trilogy wasn't the long-sought salvation for the franchise, but rather simply the latest evidence of the established consensus. There is only one story to tell with Michael Myers, and that story has been told. What? Arguably the biggest problem with the Halloween franchise is also one of its greatest strengths, Michael Myers himself. That mask, that music, it was just so instantly iconic that audiences never seemed to get enough of him. Halloween 3 was the franchise's last chance to course correct, but its dubious quality scared the producers too much to ever try anything risky again. They're too scared to even put Michael in a different costume for Christ's sake. The real issue with having Michael as your central figure is that his whole appeal is based on his mystery. Explaining him any more than you absolutely have to ruins the character completely. See Rob Zombie. I, I thought that he took away the mystique of the, of the story by explaining too much about the guy. I don't care about that. 
You also can't expand his lore or bring him into different situations and settings and still retain the eerie vibe that the first film was built on. He's not Freddy or Jason. You can't put him in the fucking dream world or take him to the big city without ruining what people liked about him in the first place. Enough of this Michael Myers bullshit! We've covered a few of the notorious declines in pop culture on this channel, and the question always comes down to what happened. But in the case of the Halloween series, the question isn't really what happened so much as what else could have happened. The inherent issues with making a franchise out of Halloween have been obvious from day one, with Carpenter and others constantly trying to steer the series away from Michael Myers, but to no avail. So number four, I get them all out, and I did number four. Going back to the basic elements of one, we always, always go back to the basics, and it works. An entire franchise built on a character that can't be developed was always destined to become stale and repetitive. Every new iteration and reboot manages only one decent retelling before falling on its face with the follow-up. Maybe that was just its inescapable fate, or a natural element, or whatever the fuck Samuels was talking about. That's right, Samuels definitely personified fate. Blumhouse appears to be bearing out this destiny, with Halloween Ends promising little more than a final, final confrontation between Michael and Laurie. Again. But who knows, this supposed conclusion could give the series the big send-off it always deserved. One could argue that perhaps the third time's the charm, but the thirteenth? No!